Okay, let's get stuck into our weekend report card. And this weekend, only two teams, so we're going to cover it all in one, talk about some of the um, kind of crazy race situations in what was a fantastic race between Luna Rossa and Ineos Team UK to decide the Prada Cup round robin. So starting conventionally at the start of the race, we're going to talk about the hook or the missed hook that uh, Team Ineos went for. And quite an interesting contrast to the first race of the Prada Cup round robin where Luna Rossa were the team hunting for a hook and that kind of blew back straight in their face. So, Rob, here we are, last race of the series, and roles are reversed. We see Ineos failing to get a hook. Is this, um, is this a mistake from, from Team Ineos? We don't see many mistakes from them, but is this a, is this a sign of weakness? What do you think? No, I, I think this was actually quite nicely controlled from Ineos. So the situation was fairly different to the, the initial one in the, uh, the Prada series against Luna Rossa, because... In this case, both boats are early for the line and... ...dive down low and looking for the hook. It's, it's just helping you in killing time, if nothing else. And I think also both boats are set up high versus the pin lay. So it's, it's worth a shot from Ineos to try and force Luna Rossa down below that pin lay. But if you look at the way they execute this, as soon as... As soon as Luna Rossa bring the bow down to match, Ineos then bring their bow up and they gain some gauge up to weather. So I think Ineos have a, a good mentality here. They're not necessarily going for the killer move where they have to crush Luna Rossa off the pre-start. They're, they're happy to just try their luck, see if it works. But if not, they're just setting up to windward with enough gauge. They can get their even start and then race from there. The failure situation for Ineos is actually still pretty good, isn't it? Because you've got Luna Rossa then having to kill more speed in the final few seconds before the before the start. Is that what we're saying? Saying there? Yeah, and in fairness to Luna Rossa, I think they actually do quite a good job of defending this. So th the start's very even, and Ineos get a slight jump just because of their timed run in the final four seconds being marginally better. So. Luna Rossa are having to do a turn up onto the breeze in the final two seconds. And that is possibly caused because Ineos have forced them a little bit too close to the line. But ultimately, it was quite an even start. Let's discuss something else, though, about this that we've seen in this hook manoeuvre from Ineos, which is hugely interesting. Um, and that is what Giles Scott is doing with his hands during the bare way for the hook. Talk us through this, Rob. So Giles is grabbing an inner wheel that they have, and he's turning that. And we've speculated quite a lot on what this could be. Um, I think what this is, and it's something that I've seen on fast power boats before, is effectively the ability to adjust the gearing in the steering wheel. So what that would be doing is changing the, the, the number of turns that it will take on the main wheel to turn lock to lock. So in the race, what because the boats are going so fast and they're sailing quite a straight line, you, you want the wheel to not be very sensitive. So you want a very small rudder movement for a given movement with your hands. And we can work through this logically, can't we? Because we, we actually have really good information about who's doing what on the boat, or uh, uh, say good information, good speculation. So we see on the on the leeward side, you've got Luke Parkinson, who is doing um, piloting the the main foil. So if there was any adjustment that needed to be done there, Luke Parkinson could surely make it. Um, he's concentrating on nothing else. Ben, obviously... He's steering the boat from the leeward side at this whilst he's calling the hook, which is pretty obvious as well. It's a good side of the boat to be on to gauge 
gauge that decision against Luna Rossa. Um, bled him on main sheet with his little um, Nintendo um, controller. And then on the windward side, we also see Lee McMillan isn't grinding. He's doing pitch with his right hand on the, um, on the piloting controls. So it's not another pitch control that Giles is doing. So that leaves us with very little in terms of the kind of major controls of the boat that it, that it really could be. And it makes sense to be, you know, associated with the steering of the boat, the fact you've got a, a wheel next to the main wheel. Yeah, I think I think if it was a hydraulic thing, then we'd be seeing. It, to me, it makes no sense for the input to be the wheel if it was a hydraulic thing. Um. Okay, right. Let's talk about <clears throat> Luna Rossa, and I've put out a separate video <coughs> on the communication errors in their tax and the timing of the tax. Um, what do you think of Luna Rossa's attempts at the Lee Bow, Rob? Well, I think their intentions are good. They don't execute the tax very well, and you show that in your video. And I think also, as you show in your video, it's um, it's largely down to the communication on the entry to those tax. Uh, they need to have a lesson from Dean Barker, really, because he's executed some really good leave out tax during this Prada Cup. And we also talked about the the luffs that Luna Rossa do and kind of speculating a little bit about that. I think, I mean, I'm not a big fan of the luffs. I've said this. I think my personal opinion is those are kind of like sharp luffs are losing them more than they're gaining. And I also <clears> think the kind of the penalty call there, I mean, yes, they're always going to ask for the protest, but I also, the penalties in these boats, we've got a, another video coming out with Nick Cherry talking about the, the match rating tactics and the and the significance of the penalties but it's a 50 meter penalty like by the time someone's tacked away then they've paid their penalty so getting a penalty on someone isn't really that significant from my perspective with the luff you just want to squeeze someone out into attack but getting a penalty isn't really isn't really the, the game so I think it, with, the, with the position that Luna Rossa are in, the, the worst thing for them would be to get to that left-hand boundary with Ineos still above them. Because at, at that point, that both boats are going to attack with the boundary protection. But because Luna Rossa are not very bow forward on starboard, they're going to come out and pretty much be dead behind Ineos on the port tack back, which would clearly be terrible. It puts them in that position where they're closer to the short boundary in dirt and requires two tacks. So I think Luna Rossa get to a point where they feel they have to try and make Ineos split away just so that they can get to the get to the boundary and not be compromised massively when they end up coming back on port tack. Hmm. So so I I do kind of see what they're doing. And yeah, I think from a from a short term loss and gain thing, is the luff a gain or a loss? Well, probably a loss because you're not sailing at your optimum speed. But I think it's a smaller loss than if you have to sail back from the port boundary, just in dirt. Cunningham. So a big, a significant um, happening before the race was Team Ineos's Cunningham system. The hydraulics breaking in it. They had to call a timeout so they could fix it they couldn't fix it so they had to basically lash the Cunningham Ineos had a fully functioning Cunningham how much quicker they would have been maybe we wouldn't have seen possibly the greatest race <laughs> of the um in AC 75s if if Ineos had a working working Cunningham what do you think do you think well I'm not sure looking at the data if there is that much evidence for it if i'm honest we we saw them sailing higher and faster than luna rossa downwind so could they have just sailed a bit lower and matched luna rossa downwind scrub a bit of speed and scrub a bit of height but but then thinking about this potentially they're just sailing the boat to a heel angle downwind 
Um, like so, a skiff does. Like a skiff, yeah. So if they sail a bit lower, they're going to get a bit of windward heel. Well, that would require a foil cant change. And maybe the maybe the loop here is actually just very complicated. And Yeah, because we do hear them talking when they're kind of fixing this um, Cunningham system and they get a bit of input from off the boat to bled in of, of how they can adjust. And they say, we're going to have to go with more mass rotation and more outhaul ease to compensate for the Cunningham downwind. Um, so they obviously are thinking about what else they could do, but we've had a little dive into the data. And Ineos are sailing typically downwind with a 60 degree cant angle. And that didn't change for this race. So they didn't, so they effectively have kept their leverage the same downwind, haven't they? Yeah. And then sailed with a flatter sail. Yeah, so typically if you have less power in the rig, so if, you're, if your healing force reduces, you need to reduce your writing moment. And the way they reduce writing moments in these boats is by reducing cant. So, I mean, we, we've we looked at the data quite a lot. You go around in circles, and I think it could just be one of those things that on the fly, they've had a last-minute breakage, They've got plenty of other things they're thinking about trying to win this race. Maybe the safe thing to do is you just sail with your known cant angles and you accept that to maintain heel, you have to sail a little bit higher. Sailing wider angles, and this is discussed in some of the uh, Beth weight high performance sailing, it, it, it means you can scan the course quicker. So if, if there's a gain somewhere on the course, you can get to that much quicker and you have a lot more opportunity in your boat to kind of to utilize those gains across across the um across the field and i think i know part of me i i don't i still do think it was a significant thing this this cunningham um and ultimately when you look at the deltas the downwind deltas ineos ineos win all the downwinds which is where you think this would impact most yeah i mean I, i'm not denying that the cunningham is a factor but okay let's finally talk about the deciding instant there was so much to and fro in these races i mean the long and short of it both boats had li little incidents luna rossa had the two crap tacks which i've covered elsewhere then the big delta changes with the with the two beats basically luna rossa made a load on the second beat were just in phase um the third beat ineos brought themselves right back into it and that was mostly due to the um, mark rounding, Lewid mark, two foils down, swung it round straight into the tack. And I covered that in the previous video, so we won't. And coming down the last run, it was neck and neck and went down to the final cross. What What do you see? Did, you know, Jimmy, obviously, even by the time he got to the presser, still thought this was a penalty. What, what What's your opinion on that, Rob? I don't think it was a penalty. Um... I think both boats are just changing course all the time. And at some point, it's that right of way boat. You just have to hold your course. Um, so the way, the way the umpires will be looking at this is they're just saying, which it is the right of way boat holding course. If you're not, then you have to give the other boat room to keep clear. At some point, you have to hold your course. And I just don't think Luna Ross would ever do that. Then they do this <clears throat> scoot up around the back, which is a bit of a, as Ken Reed calls it, a Hollywood move, trying to sell it to the umpire. Um, and then ultimately they go behind, drop off the foils and don't get back into it. It, it did feel a bit like a last ditch effort to, to claw the race back. And maybe the better thing to do would have been race hard to the finish. Yeah. Okay, finally, you know, Obviously, where do they go from here? Ineos have got going straight into the um, Challenger final. They've got a bit of extra time to develop the boats. So that'll be interesting to see if see what their shore shore team comes up with. But Luna Ross are now reeling from this um, this round round robin. What will they be thinking? They they've got a weekend racing American Magic. Well, there's obviously a lot of pressure on Luna Rossa now. They're in a must-win matchup. Um, it's going to be really interesting to see how these new foils they've put on match up to the American Magic team in the breeze. 
that was obviously a point of worry for them, I would say, against American Magic if they have to race in more breeze. But they're going to go into that matchup on a on a losing trend. And I know American Magic have had a had two weeks in the shed where they're having to rebuild the boat, but the fact they're going to get a boat on the water probably means they come out feeling pretty positive. So if, if they can get a couple of wins on the board, they're going to have this real upward trajectory in the team. And that's going to be very hard for Luna Rossa to turn around. I mean, on the face of it, you look at you look at Luna Rossa and you say, yes, they've come second in this round robin. Um, they could have even won the round robin on the on the on today if they if they taken a race yesterday. So they did take it into the into the final weekend with a you know a decent chance of winning, and they've shown good boat speed at times certainly. But on the flip side of it, they've only really won one race in the whole round round robin, haven't they? And that was in their by far favoured conditions against American Magic. They have to measure the boats a couple of days before racing. So it's going to be interesting to see what foils Luna Rossa declare. Mm. Um, that'll obviously be based on forecast. But from a sailing point of view, and we, we've again seen Luna Rossa make mistakes due to communication difficulties between the two helmsmen in those first beat tacks. So they're going to have to work on that a little bit. They can't afford to make mistakes like that. I think people have asked in the comments of the of the videos, like, does one the helms need to go? Could you make a drastic change at, at this stage? What do you think? Are, do you think it is getting to that point where they just need to say, you're helming, I'm tactician, let's, let's take it from there? Or do, you, or do you think the changes can be more subtle than that? I think the changes can be more subtle than that, but they just have to agree who who is doing what to all points you, uh, the video you've put out on their tax clearly shows that there's too much overlap in in what both helms are saying so i think they they can just look at that and make some decisions on who's going to say what and that <laughs> should wrap it up i think so fixable maybe not even a, a massive fix but just some some subtleties they they need to to better rehearse Let's talk, what, what are you expecting from American Magic? I mean, it's, it's really hard to say, isn't it, after all the images coming out of the major repairs they're doing. What, how, how, do you, how do you mark their chances, Rob? Well, I think, I think they're going to get a boat on the water. They'll have made the fixes, but they're also going to have made some changes. They'll have had upgrades in the pipeline that they'd wanted to implement anyway, and this gives them an opportunity to do that. So... I'd expect to see American Magic come out faster than before. They'll have obviously done quite a lot of work on their communication. I found it telling in the first press conference after the capsize, Terry really defended the decision-making on board. And then in a follow-up one, the follow-up press conference, which he gave ahead of this weekend, you know, to give an update on the repairs, he reflected a bit more on it. And he was more critical there, not not specifically of any person, but he did say they had identified the communication issues. And, you know, he was referring to it as a problem that they tried to fix, whereas in the first presser, obviously, it's, it was really raw. And it was kind of it was kind of it was even talking as if they had a problem, which I found a little bit worrying. But I think there's a glimmer of hope there that it's been recognised within the team and they're working to and have worked to fix it. Yeah, and I think Terry's a really great leader of that team. And his job initially was not to say, yes, we've made mistakes. His job was to protect his team who were feeling really raw about what had happened. So while we're sitting there going, give us the dirt, He's not going to do that. He's a pro and he did what he needed to do to, to protect his guys. Yeah, now a bit of time has passed. It's easier to reflect. They can do that. And he does that in a way that is not critical of individuals. So I can see that he's a great leader for that team to have around. Yeah. Right. I think we'll call it a day. I'm really looking forward to the semi-finals. I think it's going to be a close matchup. I hope 
hope upon hope that American Magic can get the boat there and get it get it competitive. I think the 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 big logistical challenges are going to be commissioning it. All the all the electronics it's going to be a complete nightmare debugging that as you um as you aim to get it back on the water. So fingers crossed for them, and we don't see any kind of technical issues from from that regard. But um yeah, I think thanks everyone for listening, and a few more videos coming out this week, which I think will be interesting for you all on on the foil foil problem a bit of a, a rule wrangling around that as well and um yeah we'll catch up next weekend after some more racing thanks